Okay, so we're now recording this session. This is March 31st, and we'll call this recording just a brief, a really brief introduction on some of the processes at work as we describe the judicial branch of government. You will please recall with me that Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution says judicial power shall be vested in one Supreme Court. When the Constitution says the phrase vested, it means to say that judicial power will be housed inside, will, be, will live inside the Supreme Court and the Constitution goes on to say, Article 3, Section 1, Clause 1, and in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish, right? So just as assuredly as your heart is vested inside your chest cavity, so too then does is judicial power vested inside the court, the federal court system. So let's talk about that. When we move through the slides, I wanted to pay uh, you folks to pay attention to the words that are inscribed literally on the top of the Supreme Court building. Remember with me, we already covered the original dilemma of government where we said that freedom is in a sense of competition with order, that you can't maximize freedom and order at the same time. So to increase one is to decrease the other. So on one side of the Supreme Court building, it says, equal justice under the law, equal justice under the law, freedom, equal justice under the law, order, freedom versus order. On the other side of the Supreme Court building, you'll remember we spoke about the modern dilemma of government, where the modern dilemma says that freedom is in a certain amount of conflict with equality, that if you increase equality in the society, you might be diminishing freedom. If you increase freedom, you might be diminishing equality. Look at the building. The Supreme Court building says justice is going to be the guardian of liberty. Those are pretty words. Those are charged words. The original and modern dilemma on the, on the side of the building. Here you have a conception of lady justice. I would ask you to remember with me uh, earlier in the semester, we went over the four essential qualities of the state, according to Max Weber. You remember, we, are, we did this for a, you know, quite a bit. Max Weber, 1918, writes this essay called Politics as Vocation, where he says the four essential qualities of the state is one, a defined set of territorial boundaries. Second, where the official institutions enjoy a monopoly on rulemaking. Third, these official institutions control the means of coercion. And fourth, uh, international sovereignty. Okay, so this here is called Lady Justice. She, on her, what is that? In her left hand, she has a scale that is supposed to conceptualize justice where she is equally, where she is weighing the relative validity of both sides of the argument, right? Uh huh. In her right hand, she has a sword. Why does Lady, Just Lady uh, Justice have a sword? What do you do with swords? You stab people. Why is she threatening to, even though the sword is pointed down, why is she threatening to stab you? Because as Weber told, uh, told us, the third uh, uh, characteristic of the state is to say that you are in control over the means of coercion. So this sword here then represents the binding nature of her decisions, that you have to follow her uh, decisions. And then why is Lady Justice blindfolded? What's that blindfold supposed to mean to us, right? The blindfold is supposed to mean that she is impartial in how she weighs the relative validity of the various claims on her scale, that she's gonna be blind impartial in her administration of the law as presupposed by that sword. Now, just, to have, just for us to start the discussion, right? So that's Lady Justice. Now, I would also call your attention to the notion that the, the usage of scales to weigh arguments, the use of a scale to administer justice is not anything new to the United States, not even, even new to Western history. You'll remember with me that in ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt on the papyrus of Ani, as you see here, this is, let me make it bigger. In this picture here, you see a depiction of the weighing of the heart on the scales. 
here you see Anubis judging the weights. You see here is the heart of the feather, right? The feather of Ma'at. And this is the Abd or the heart of the dead person. If that dead person's heart is lighter, lighter than the feather, then he gets to go and live. He gets to go to heaven. But if the heart is heavier than the feather, if he done things in his life to make his heart heavier than the feather, then this creature here, A-P-E-P, Apep, eats his heart. So I just wanted to show you that conceptions of uh, justice depicted by scales, this is as old as human civilization. We find that in Africa 5,000 years from where we are today. Now, let's talk specifically about how a Supreme Court justice gets onto the bench. Presidents, you'll remember with me in the Constitution that presidents have the power, Article 2, Section 2, to nominate people to the bench. Let's refer to your Constitution. So what we're saying here, here comes the Constitution. All right, here we go. Right, so this is your Constitution. We'll scroll our way to Article 2, Section 2. We'll see what we're talking about. The President of the United States does have the power to nominate justices to the bench, right? So you see here, Article 2, Section 2. He shall have the power. Uh, let's see here, right? Uh, by and with advice and, and consent of the Senate to nominate counsels and judges of the Supreme Court. Okay. So that's what we see here, right? But upon what basis does the President of the United States nominate a justice to the bench? Let's be clear. It is not because it, the only reason that a president nominates someone to the bench is because of ideological similarity to the president. That is to say that liberal presidents nominate liberals to the bench, that conservative presidents nominate conservative jurists to the bench. Okay, so once that nomination is made, it's up to the Senate Judiciary Committee to interview the candidate, to hold them to account to some of their uh, judicial beliefs, and then to make a recommendation to the full floor of the Senate. So the Judiciary Committee then holds hearings on the viability of that candidate for the, uh, for the position, in this case, for the Supreme Court. The things that we get to see is where the, you know, the candidate shakes hands with the senator, they smile for the camera, and then they go into the back, right? And for example, the, Supreme, uh, the Senate senator will ask the nominee for the Supreme Court, what's your opinion on Roe versus Wade? Supreme Court jurist uh, candidates, they don't answer that question, right? Because they don't want to, one, they don't want to say what their opinion is on abortion. So then the Senate will ask a question about a case that leads up to the decision on abortion. For example, what's your view on Griswold versus Connecticut? So, and, you know, that doesn't work anymore. But let's say about 30 years ago, folks would give, well, maybe about 20 years ago, folks would give an opinion on what they thought about Griswold versus Connecticut. In Griswold versus Connecticut, the Supreme Court famously said that the Ninth Amendment creates a zone of privacy around the body of an individual. And that zone of privacy then protects people's ability to make reproductive choices. Griswold versus Connecticut was not about abortion, it was about uh, contraceptives. But Griswold versus Connecticut provides the precedent upon which Roe versus Wade stands. So that's part of what happens during the, do you smell that? Yeah, that's part of what happens during the, uh, you know, Senate Judiciary hearings, right? So the Senate Judiciary, they're going to hold hearings, they're going to interview the candidates, and then they're going to make a recommendation to the full floor of the Senate. And then the Senate might hold, uh, you know, hearings themselves. Typically, the Senate follows the recommendations of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, in some cases, they will fight against the nominee, and if the let's say a Republican president nominates a conservative and the liberals have the strength in the Senate, then they can possibly block that nomination. In the final analysis, the Senate votes on the nomination, either it's up or down. 
And if it's, you know, if it's up, that person gets to bed, gets to the bench, and they hold a lifetime appointment. Remember with me, when we went, talked about the presidency, we said that presidents are concerned with growing the power of the White House. They want to leave the Oval Office in a stronger position than it was when they came in to take the seat. So the uh, so the president then, what they look to do is, right, so what the president looks to do is leave an impression. He looks to leave a legacy. And so this is what we're showing you on this slide, right? We are still dealing with the, uh, you know, with the presidency of, for example, Bush 41. He himself is gone, he's dead, right? However, he nominated, for example, Clarence Thomas to the bench, and he's still on the bench right now. We're still dealing with Clarence Thomas's, uh, you know, judicial opinions on the bench. And in that way, we are still dealing with the Bush 41 presidency. So for your lifetime, during your lifetime, or at least during this current presidency, Donald Trump has nominated Neil Gorsuch and uh, Justice Kavanaugh to the bench. They are relatively young people. They're both in their 50s, I believe, right now. And so you're going to grow old with them, grow older, and as they grow old, and you'll be dealing with, you know, the Trump presidency in the form of Neil Gorsuch on the bench, for example, well after Donald Trump is gone out of office. So that's why we talk about that. Now, the average age of the Supreme Court justices is 65. However, the average age of the American citizenry is 37. How is it possible then, not possible, let's say, does it make sense for a Supreme Court that is almost double the age of the American citizenry, does it make sense then for them to be able to tell the American people what to do? Because that is indeed what they do. That is, that is indeed what happens. The Supreme Court justices, over the last, let's say, 10 years or so, I mean, let's do American history, but taking the last 10 years as an example, they have rendered decisions that get down to the minutia of the life of an average citizen. Average citizens play video games. The Supreme Court actually rendered a decision, was actually asked to render a decision on whether or not violent video games can be sold in a store that also sells material toys to minors, right? And the Supreme Court could have said no, and then perhaps you wouldn't be able to buy, uh, let's say something like Grand Theft Auto or Doom Eternal in Walmart. However, the Supreme Court said that video games have a First Amendment protection just as other forms of art. So that's an interesting thing. In recent years, Supreme Court, Supreme Court, uh, uh, the Supreme Court, has rendered decisions on whether or not unlimited campaign contributions can flow to super PACs. They said yes to that. This is the famous Citizens United decision. In Heller versus DC and in McDonald versus Chicago, 2008 and 2010 respectively, the Supreme Court has rendered decisions to say neither the federal nor the state government can limit handgun ownership, right? Section five of the Voting Rights Act was repealed in Shelby County versus Holder. We'll talk about that for a little bit today, I believe, right? And in the uh, Hobby Lobby case, the Supreme Court ruled that the, uh, a religious family that owns a corporation cannot be required to offer contraceptive care in the healthcare plan for their female employees. That the religious views of the corporate owner take precedent over the healthcare needs of the employee. That's one way to say it, right? So just as an example, you'll look through these slides, you've got them posted. Look at what the 2000, you know, look at what the Supreme Court said 2012, 2013. It rendered decisions on same-sex marriage. That's the Obergefell decision. In the in 2014, 2015 uh, cycle, the Supreme Court rendered a decision questioning what kind of rap lyrics would be protected by the First Amendment. They, they ruled that a Muslim woman can wear a headscarf and work in a clothing store and so on and so forth. 
So that's what we're doing with these uh, slides here. Now, we're just walking through these slides. I want you to read this stuff to prep you for, you know, coming up with a good answer for the test that I just sent you, right? On the left there, that's Clarence Thomas. We just mentioned him. He was nominated to the bench by Bush 41. Next to him there pictured is his wife, Virginia Thomas, Ginny Thomas. Virginia Thomas is a well-known, very active uh, partisan. She's a conservative thought leader. She works for various, let's call them think tanks, and she comes up with position papers. She comes up with, for the Trump administration, enemies lists. And so that I'm just saying she's very active in conservative Republican Party politics. She's married to a Supreme Court justice. We just saw, showed that Lady Liberty, Lady Justice rather, is supposed to be blindfolded, as in the administration of justice in the United States, is supposed to be impartial and unbiased. However, if he is married to Virginia Thomas and she is a conservative thought leader, how impartial could we assume Clarence Thomas to be? Is he impartial at all? Or is he some type of conservative warrior on top of the Supreme Court just on, on the Supreme Court bench? I'm offering you a couple of slides here to show you that Virginia Thomas has been well active in Republican Party politics in the 21st century. And so I want you, you know, you can flip through some of this stuff here that Virginia Thomas does have a history of, oh, let's say racially insensitive to be nice, uh, you know, postings on social media. And then this is something I wish we were in class so we could read it together. Go to that webpage and you'll find that earlier this year, it was somewhat proven that Virginia Thomas is helping uh, produce a deep state hit list is what this Axios reporter called it, or an enemies list of people that are inside the administration, but are unfriendly or critical of Donald Trump. That is, that's a heck of a thing to my eye, right? So my question to you is how can the Supreme Court be impartial, one, if they're married to partisan activists, right? Clarence Thomas. But secondly, how can the Supreme Court be impartial when they are proven to have a corporatist bias, as in rendering decisions where they take corporate needs over the needs of regular citizens, as in the Hobby Lobby case? I want you to think about how can the Supreme Court be independent when its members are chosen by the president and approved by the Senate largely based on their ideological similarity to the political party in charge. One more time, how can the Supreme Court be neutral in the conflict between wealthy citizens and the rank and file middle class working and poor people when the members of the federal judiciary are often wealthy lawyers that have attended the most prestigious and expensive law schools and have thus been injected with a class bias. I want you to think about that kind of thing. Look at this here. Well, you can look at that, right? But let's go here. Let's do some definitions. The Judiciary Act of 1789 is where the Supreme, is where the Congress creates a federal judiciary. Refer with me, please, to Article 3 of your Constitution. I'm scrolling. We said earlier that Article 3 of the Constitution says judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. And in such inferior courts as who shall ordain and establish? As Congress may ordain and establish. 1789, Congress does just that. Remember that year is important, 1789, is the first year of operation for the US government under the Constitution. So the very first Congress in the first year of government under this Constitution says we're gonna create a federal judiciary. So the Judiciary Act of 1789 creates this judiciary coexistent yet independent from the state courts. And then here we come to 
the big case, the fundamental case. American traditions of jurisprudence are predicated on the Supreme Court's rendering in Marbury versus Madison. Chief Justice John Marshall famously says in Marbury versus Madison that if the courts are to interpret wrong, to see, that he says that if the courts are to determine if a law is in line with the Constitution, the courts absolutely have to interpret that law. But then he also says the courts have to have the power to interpret the meaning of the Constitution. And once the Supreme Court interprets the meaning of the Constitution, no other body, no other governmental entity should be able to come behind the Supreme Court and reinterpret the Constitution. So this power coming from Marbury versus Madison, this is called the power of judicial review. Judicial review means the Supreme Court is the final authority on the meaning of the Constitution, okay? That is to say, look at that first line, that the courts have the power to declare national, state, and local laws invalid if the court finds that this law is in violation of the Constitution. So what I mean to say here is that the Supreme Court looks at a law passed by Congress, and they can look at that law and say, wait a minute, this is outside the meaning of the Constitution, therefore that law is invalidated. Well, the Supreme Court can look at an action undertaken by the president and can say, wait a minute, Mr. President, this thing that you purport to do is outside the meaning of the Constitution, so you cannot do that thing. We earlier said that the Supreme Court is not elected. They are nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate for a term of life. How is it possible in a system that's supposed to be democratic that the Supreme Court can overturn the laws or the actions of the democratically elected branches of government, right? So that's why we say that judicial review is really, really a fundamental power of the courts. Let me refer you to this quote by Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton, primary author of Federalist Number 78. You'll remember with me that the Federalist Papers are a series of arguments used to explain the philo philosophical underpinnings of certain parts of the Constitution, All right? So, if that's going to be the case, not, not, that is the case. So Alexander Hamilton, right? Alexander should have left Aaron Burr alone. Hamilton, he says that night in Federalist 78, he says neither force nor will, merely judgment, refers to the power or the authority of the Supreme Court. He says the Supreme Court will have not force, as in the Supreme Court won't be able to make you do anything that's what Congress does. They make the laws, right? The Supreme Court will not have will. Alexander Hamilton says neither force nor will. The Supreme Court won't will. It won't do anything on its own. That's up to the president or the executive branch. That's the doing branch of government. So Hamilton here says that neither force nor will, but the Supreme Court has judgment or the power of the Supreme Court lies in ba bum ba bum ba bum judicial review 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 okay so that's that's a key point there to make right now you see that i do have a few things here for you on these slides i really want you to think about for whom the law exists who benefits from the law who 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 writes the law right let's let's do that for a second then i'll stop talking and let you go today uh John Jay, another one of the authors of the Federalist Papers. John Jay, who becomes the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. John Jay once said, the people who own, it's raining really hard. If I get cut off, I'll just stop the recording and I'll send it to you. John Jay once said, the people who own the country ought to govern it. Really, John Jay, are you saying that economic uh, holdings is a value judgment for 
political power. Mm -hmm. Hofstadter, you remember we went through the Hofstadter argument 1948, where he looked at the framers of the Constitution, how they are anti-democratic, how they are anti-dictatorship, um, and they landed on republicanism as the preferred rule of government. Hofstadter tells us that wherever the real power in a government lies, there is the danger of oppression. And in our government, the real power lies in the majority of the community. The real power lies in the majority of the community. All right, and what's that majority? That means we're talking about the economic majority, that's poor people. The law is a human invention. It is created by human beings. Human beings are motivated by their own particular interests and the inputs that impact their social interactions. So if the law is developed from the perceived interests and actions of particular groups, then the question becomes, which group has the power to develop the law? And then does the law fundamentally serve the interests of that group over the interests of a group that does not have the power to develop the laws for themselves? Then, the, so that leads us to the notion that the law then is an instrument for placing the power of government behind the various practices that impact people's lives. There wouldn't be any problem with that if life was just fine in the United States. But what if there's some fundamental inequalities in the United States? Then what if then the law becomes the functionary? The law then serves to reproduce the very inequalities that society has to offer case in point. One in four Americans has a criminal record and 65 million Americans report, no, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's what we want to say. So 65 million Americans have a criminal record that employers use to discriminate against them. It's supposed to be illegal to discriminate against people with a criminal record, but we know that it happens all the time, even if it's true that one third of felony arrests never leads to a conviction that felony arrest tends to show up on a background check. So people, when they go to prison, they report wages. I have another slide here. They report that their wages prior to going to prison were underneath $12,000. That means that people go to, that poor people tend to go to prison, right? In large numbers. When you get out of prison, do you suddenly have, you know, job skills that put you in, you know, a management track in a large scale corporation? You do not. And so you go to prison poor, you get out of prison poor. And so once you get out of prison and you're already poor, then there's a certain amount of discrimination, uh, employment discrimination that you have to face. So what followed this argument with me? Unemployment amongst the poor becomes rampant. And when employers do things outside the law, then this unemployment becomes common or a fancy word for it, it becomes endemic. Now, when an industry grows up around imprisoning the poor, the unemployment that is endemic, it becomes systemic, it becomes system-wide. Therefore, systemic imprisonment and endemic unemployment, this creates a society that has fundamental inequalities at its core, and these inequalities wind up being backed up by Supreme Court decisions. This Zoom thing tells me I got about six minutes left. I'm gonna use and stick with me. All right, so uh, where does the law come from? The law comes from government. What if government reproduces inequality? Let's go to Blackstone's Commentaries, the document that provides the basis for English law and by extension provides the basis for colonial law, which then provides the basis for American law, Blackstone's Commentaries, where it says, so great is the regard of the law for private property that it will not authorize the least violation of it. No, not even for the common good of the whole community that the law is designed to protect private property. Let's go to the father of capitalism, the laissez-faire God who waves the invisible hand and sets prices during the market interaction between producers and consumers. Let's go to Adam Smith in his, what is it, 1776 book, Wealth of Nations. Adam Smith says, till there be property, 
there can be no government, the very end of which is to secure wealth and defend the rich from the poor. Excuse me, Adam Smith, what is the purpose of government? It is to secure the wealth and to defend the rich from the poor. Let's go then to the British utilitarian philosopher, Jeremy Bentham, where he once said, property and the law are born together. They must die together. Before the law, there was no property. Take away the law, all property ends. Well, where does the law come from? In the American government, Congress writes the laws, the executive branch enforces the law, the supreme, the, the, the judicial branch. They interpret the law. The law comes from the government. But wait a minute, what if the government is influenced by powerful economic groups that often serve to undermine the best interests of the poor and working class people? What if we see it true that at least three billion per year is spent to lobby the government, right? Lobbying, as we will see, I prepared a set of videos for you guys already, so I'm lined up for the next set of slides. But we'll see that uh, lobbying is where interest groups look to impress their needs upon the government so that they can get policies or laws written in their favor, and their favor is to make more and more money to increase their profit margins. Three billion dollars spent to lobby the government. These corporations have people that are working for their interests. Who? is working for your best interest. And so walk through the rest of these slides here. I'm gonna stop talking, I guess, right now. This thing tells me I only have three minutes left anyway. You see, we have a set of definitions. I want you to go through, you know, the book or the slides and, and you know, work your way through these definitions and then spend some time on this chart here and you'll see how the Supreme Court makes its decisions. All right, with that brief discussion for class, I'm gonna end the recording.